your Bibles, we go to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. I tell you, I've had a great time with you all this week, and I, I can't believe this is the last night already. At the beginning, it seems like it's going to be a long time, and then when the last day gets here, you think, where did the time go? But I certainly had a great time, and I want to thank you all for your hospitality and being so kind. Um, I'm not sure who left the bag out there for my mom uh, for her birthday today, but I just want to say thank you. I already told her about it, and she's excited about getting it, so I really appreciate, appreciate that. And um, someone gave me a bag of Reese cups. Thank you for that. <laughs> Praise God. And some sour, uh, chewy candy. That's about gone already. Um, and I want to thank the Ratliff family for hosting me uh, this week. Anyone that tells me I can just walk and in, go into their refrigerator, we like best friends, all right? <laughs> I mean, I really appreciate it. If you can go over somebody's house and eat Captain Crunch in the middle of the night, those are some good people, all right? <laughs> so I just want to say thank you, and I've, I've had a great time. You've been great host, and I slept so good in the bedroom, it was ridiculous, all right? But I, I just want to say thank you, and I really appreciate you all as a church family and you all for being faithful. There's been great attendance every night this week, so I want to thank you for your faithfulness, and it really shows a uh, great character of your church family, so thank you for that. But Exodus chapter 17, Exodus chapter 17, I want to share something with the church family tonight that I believe if a church gets this, it can really be a blessing to the ministry in Exodus chapter 17. We're going to begin reading in verse number eight. If you haven't found Exodus by now, it's going to be a long night, all right? <laughs> Exodus 17, verse eight. The Bible says, then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the sun. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord have sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Lord, I thank you for being so good and kind to us. God, I thank you for blessing us with another opportunity to be here in your house tonight. God, I thank you for blessing us with the good week so far. But God, we've come to the last night, but Lord, it's not over yet. So God, I pray that you'll speak to hearts tonight, God, and change lives as only you can. God, I pray that this revival meeting will go long past tonight. God, may you continue to work in the hearts of individuals in this church, God. And we just continue to give you all the praise and honor for it. In your name we do pray. Amen. I believe most of us understand tonight that the children of Israel are God's chosen people. Not used to be God's chosen people, not were God's chosen people, but even today they are still God's chosen people. They were not chosen because they were great. They were not chosen because they were special. In fact, they were chosen because they were the least of the nation, and God wanted to show the world how great he was. They didn't always choose God, but God chose them. And when we look into the Bible, just even looking at the children of Israel, we can see how amazing the providence of God is. Oftentimes we forget that when the children of Israel came into Egypt, that they came into Egypt on good terms. They were not always slaves when they were in Egypt. The Bible says in Exodus chapter number one that they were fruitful. They increased abundantly. They became mighty and strong. But the middle in the, of their increase, the Bible says that there arose a new king that knew not Joseph. And at this time, the children of Israel, they lose their favor with man. But aren't you glad that even when you lose your favor with man, you can still keep your favor with God? And by the way, having favor with God is more important than having favor with the man. They lost their favor with the king, but they kept their favor with the king of kings. The new king, he felt threatened by the children of Israel. He felt that because they were becoming so strong that if a war broke out, they could possibly defeat him and his throne. 
So he made them slaves. And now we find the children of Israel, we find God's chosen people being enslaved and being in bondage to the Egyptians. But I like what the Bible said in Exodus chapter 1, verse number 12. The Bible says that the more they were afflicted, the more they grew and multiplied. It's so amazing to me because everyone goes through some type of affliction in life. And you cannot choose your affliction in life, but you can choose how you respond to how you're being afflicted. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, we'll get down in the dumps and we'll start pouting. We'll start getting all grumpy and feeling defeated because we're being afflicted. And we'll miss out on our opportunity to grow in the middle of our affliction. David said, it was good for me that I have been afflicted. James said, the trying of your faith worketh patience. So let patience have her perfect work in you that ye may be perfect in entire wanting nothing. So even in the middle of their affliction, the children of Israel, they were still growing. But now they're slaves to the Egyptians. And in the middle of their bondage, God is raising up a man to deliver them out. Basically, children of Israel, if you want out of your bondage, follow the man of God. If you want out of your slavery, follow the man of God. And of course, we know this man as Moses. God strategically placed Moses into the life of the children of Israel to lead them out of their bondage. And God still does that today. God understands that times we're going to be afflicted. God understands that times we're going to have problems in life. And God strategically places men of God into our life to help us follow them as they follow Christ. Children of Israel, if you want out of your bondage, follow the man of God. Amen. So for now, Moses, who was birthed by a Hebrew, a Hebrew woman, would for 40 years be known as the prince of Egypt. Just even looking at the life, life of Moses, we still see something amazing about the providence of God. Nothing can throw off God's plan for a person's life. Amen. Nothing can derail it. Nothing can make it change its pattern. If God has something set for that person, nothing can take that away. And even though Moses, he was born at a time where the king made a decree that all the all the male babies that were born should be killed. The midwives, they feared God more than they feared a man. And by the way, if you fear God properly, it'll lessen your fear of other people. Amen. And the Bible says that they obeyed God and they feared God more than they feared man. When we get to Exodus chapter number three, this is when the, the ministry per se of Moses really starts to take off. Moses, he never lost his heart for people. Moses never lost his heart for the children of Israel. And one day he sees a man beating one of his own men. And of course, you know the story. Moses, he tries to intervene and he ends up killing that man. And by the time we get to Exodus chapter number two and three, Moses, he's on the backside of the desert. And while Moses is walking on the backside of the desert, he sees an amazing sight. He, in fact, he sees something that's hard for us to understand. Moses, he sees a bush that is burning, but the bush is not burnt. <laughs> Look, the bush, it would be like me setting a piece of paper on fire and the, and the paper would never burn up. <laughs> and Moses said, I must turn aside and behold this great wonder. And let me say this, before you start moving closer to where God is, you must first be impressed by who he is. I tell, I tell our teenagers all the time, you are impressed by what you see and you pursue what you are impressed by. Before Moses started getting closer to that bush, he was wowed by that bush. And the Bible says that Moses went over to that bush. And then look, this is, this is so crazy now. Not only is the bush burning and the bush is not burnt, but now this bush starts talking. <laughs> Woo, I don't know if I would have kept going. I would have went the other way more than likely. But the bush starts talking to him. And as Moses is getting closer, God says, whoa, whoa, Moses. You can't just come on this. You got to take off your shoes for this is holy ground. See, as Lewis said in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, he said, if you have not removed something from your life, you being in the presence of God is questionable. The, the closer we get to God, the more things we have to let go of. And as he was entering into the presence of God, he had to take off his shoes and get this now. Not only is the bush burning and it's not burnt. The bush start ta starts talking to him, but then the bush, it said Moses. It knew his name. It didn't say, hey, guy. It didn't say, excuse me, sir. It didn't say, hey, you. It said Moses. Isn't it good to know that we serve a God? He not only knows exactly where we are, but he knows exactly who you are. Amen, Moses, and he tells Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And of course, we know that Pharaoh, he refused. But by the time we get to Exodus chapter number 13, Pharaoh has released the children of Israel. He didn't do it because he wanted to. 
He did it because Jehovah God showed himself strong in Egypt. You know the story. God had to send the plagues to hit to Egypt. And all of the plagues that God sent to the land of Egypt was a destruction of one of their gods. They, they worshiped the God of the Nile. So God turned their water into blood. They, they worshiped the frog goddess, so God sent the plague of the frogs. They worshiped the earth god, so God sent the lice. They worshiped the flies and the hectic god, so God sent the beetles. They worshiped the sacred bull god, so God sent the disease upon the cattle. They worshiped the typhoon god, so God sent the bulls. On and on it goes. Every plague that was sent to Egypt was a destruction of one of the gods they worship. So get this now. God is not just saying, I'm the one true God. God is saying that your gods are false. And the stronger Jehovah makes itself known in your life, things that have the place of God in your life, they must go. God was not just showing himself strong as Jehovah. He was showing how weak their gods really were. He destroyed all of their gods. God showed himself strong. Look, God showed himself so strong that Pharaoh himself told the children of Israel, go and serve the Lord. (laughs) First, he wouldn't let them go. He said, hey, just go, go and serve the Lord. Obey God. God promised them a land that flowed with milk and honey, but for over 40 years, the children of Israel would wander in that wilderness. But even in the wilderness, they would see God work in miraculous ways. They would see things as the parting of the Red Sea, God turning the bitter water sweet. God gave them quail to eat and gave them manna to eat. God led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Even even in the Bible, it indicates that the Bible says that their shoes never even wore out. So either their shoes grew or their feet didn't grow. Either way you look at it, it's a miracle. Look, they saw God work in a great way firsthand. But by the time we get to Exodus chapter number 17, there's a war that's taking place. They're at war now with the Amalekites. Moses quickly takes Aaron and her up to the mountain and Moses begins to pray. The Bible says with the rod of God. In his hand, Moses, being a faithful man of God, is in the mountain praying with the rod of God. And the Bible says as he's praying and he's lifting his hands up, when he lifted his hands up, the children of Israel, they were winning the battle. But as he lowered his hands, they started to lose the battle. And the Bible says that Moses hands, they began to get very heavy. And the men that he took with him pulled over a stone, the Bible says, for the man of God to sit on. But it did not stop there. The Bible says that these men literally stayed right beside Moses, holding up his hands. Tonight, I want to talk to you about supporting the man of God. Supporting the man of God. Now, we have to understand something now. Moses, he was a great man. Moses, he was a great leader. Moses, he was so great that we're still talking about him today. But at the end of the day, Moses was still just a man. And the best of men are simply men at best. Every church needs a group of a group of people that will support the man of God. And I want to tell you tonight that God has blessed you with the man of God. God God has blessed you with the man that was willing to stand in the gap and and fill that position here in the pulpit. And it would be a shame before God if God would send you a man. God would send the children of Israel Moses. And when God did all that for the children of Israel, he got here and they would not support him. I can tell you stories of churches that have fallen apart because members would not support the man of God. I, I, I don't mean just being I don't mean just being here, but supporting him in your prayers. Supporting him in your giving. If the man of God says, hey, I want to start something with the youth, you're all for it. If he says, hey, I want to ride my bike all across the country, you're all for it. That don't mean you have to go, but pray for him. But there is something special about supporting the man of God. These two men, they were there holding up the hands of the man of God. So tonight we're going to talk about supporting God's man. Notice with me, firstly, there was a hindrance in the congregation. There was a hindrance in the congregation. Look at verse number one. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. After their journeys, according to the commandments of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore, do ye tempt the Lord? Look, the people of God are in the wilderness now and they have no water to drink. 
the people began to chide with Moses. Or in other words, they began to get so angry with Moses. And Moses would later on say in the chapter that they were so angry that they were ready to stone the man of God. Look, this is so amazing now. Isn't it amazing how quickly we can forget the goodness of God? Wait a minute, children of Israel, God has just delivered you from bondage. Moses simply stretched forth his rod and the Red Sea parted. He gave you manna. He gave you quail. He led you by day and by night. And now you whine because there's no water to drink. You whine because you're thirsty. <laughs> Notice with me. Look how they were falsely evaluating. Moses said, wherefore do you, why, do, why are you chiding with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Oftentimes we get it. We get it so backwards. We think we have a problem with the person. But in truth, if we're really honest, the problem that we're having is with God. They were they were falsely evaluating. I said the other night before you go and try to handle a situ situation that's manward, go Godward. They were falsely evaluating. Then they started foolishly exaggerating. L listen to this. You ever read something in the Bible that just kind of made you laugh? Well, this was one of those things for me. Look at verse number three. And the people thirsted there for water and the people mur murmured against Moses and said, wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle? Look, uh, uh, the person that is discouraged will always over exaggerate their problems. A person that is discouraged and discontent will always over exaggerate their problem. Did you see what they said? Look, Moses, did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? And our children, they didn't stop there. Moses, you even want to kill our cows. Look, can you imagine somebody in your house coming home and saying, you know, I, I think Pastor Brian is trying to kill us. You know, I, I even think he's trying to kill our cat. I don't know what's going on. But look, look what they did. Now, the Bible says that they murmured together. Someone that always finds a problem, they will always try to find someone that can identify with their problem and agree with them. No, look, there are very few times in the church where one person will have a problem. They'll always find a group. And if you exaggerate long enough, you'll get a group together and you'll believe your own exaggeration. If you just find someone to agree with you. It, it, it's just so amazing. And listen to me now. That is something that will destroy your church. And let me show you the difference between a man of God and someone that's foolishly exaggerating their problem. What did the people do? The people went to Moses. What did Moses do? Moses didn't go back to the people. Moses went to God. The people never went to God. The people just went to another person. But Moses, he went to God. So they were foolishly exaggerating. Then they became furious with their elders. They, they really got to the point to where they wanted to kill Moses. Why, why did they want to kill Moses? Well, they foolishly exaggerated and thought Moses wanted to kill them. And Moses now, in the middle of the hindrance of the, con of the congregation, we get to there's a highlight in their calamity. Moses, he goes directly to God. And look what the Bible says in verse number five. Verse number five says, and the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with thee for the elders of Israel. Take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. Notice how they were still fervent. I, I want you to get this in your mind now. The people go to Moses. Moses, you're trying to kill us. Moses, you're trying to kill our children. Moses, you're trying to kill our cows. God goes to Moses. Look now, Moses goes to God with the burdened heart. God, what am I going to do with this people? They're ready to kill me. And look what God says. God says these first two words, go on. Wow. He says, go on before the people. And this is one of the saddest parts of the story to me because these people missed out on something that God was about to do. Wouldn't it be a shame now if the pastor had a problem in the church and he and he went to God to address the problem and God almost just spoke down to the man of God and say, hey, Pastor Brian, just go on. And here's the truth now, whether it's me or whether it's you, if one of us stopped, the work of God does not. The work of God, if I stop, God's work will still go on. And I'm just privileged and I'm just thankful that God gave me a chance to get in on it. But if I stop, God might whisper down from heaven and tell my preacher just to go on. And I'll miss out on the chance to be involved on in what God is doing. My dad, he's a um, very good construction worker. He, he can remodel anything just about. And I was doing a job with him in the summer. And that day, the plumber was supposed to show up. 
And he didn't show up. So I looked at my dad. I said, well, dad, what are we going to do today? He just looked back at me and says, hey, one monkey don't stop, no show. (laughs) And we just kept going. You know what he basically said? Go on. And look now, as much as we would love to have everyone involved in here tonight, but if you stop, guess what will happen at Clearbrook Baptist Church? It will still go on. It will still be fervent. They were still fervent. Some followed. Some followed. Look at verse number five again. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people and take with the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river and take in thine hand and go. God said, look, take some of the elders. God instructed Moses to take some of the elders and these men would be the few to witness what God was about to do. Look, I want I want to say this tonight. God can do a lot with the faithful few. God can do a great work with just a handful of people that determine they will be faithful. One thing I've learned, even just from when I was just a teenager, is to stay close to the man of God. Stay close. I I try to be as close to my pastor as I can. I try to I try to be as close to my youth pastor as I can. I just try to stay close to the man of God because God might bless him and I might have a chance to get in on it. Uh, uh, look, Elijah, he was just Elijah was just hanging around Elijah and he, he got a double portion. He was just there pouring water on the hands of the man of God and God gave him a double portion. They were still fervent. Some of them followed. He had the same faith. Verse number five again. Moses, look, you just go on. Take some of the elders. And this, this is what else I want you to take. Take the rod wherewith thou smotest the rock. Take in thine hand and go. I love this because Moses has been carrying this rod around since Exodus chapter number three. Look, this is the same rod that Moses used that he cast down and it turned into a snake. Then it turned back into a rod. The same rod that Moses stretched out before the Red Sea and the Red Sea parted. The same rod that he smote the rock with. This is the same rod. And God says, Moses, look, that same thing that worked in Exodus chapter number three. Guess what? It'll still work in Exodus chapter number 17. And I want to say tonight at Clearbrook Baptist Church, though you've been here for 32 years, don't change a thing. Why? Because it still works. Souls are still being saved. Lives are still being changed. The word of God is still being preached. Keep using the same thing because it still works. Don't change a thing. Moses, take the same rod and keep going. There are a lot of churches that are changing. There are a lot of churches that are changing. Look, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look, this thing, it still works. What God is doing needs no addition. It just needs more of the same. It still works. Moses used the same rod. Take a nine hand and go. Look, they were some satisfied folks. Y'all got to excuse me. I'm from Arkansas, all right? So we say folks down there. Y'all know what that means, folks? We say folks in Arkansas, all right? There were some satisfied folks. Look at verse number six. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Boy, aren't you glad tonight that God doesn't treat us like we treat others and oftentimes treat him? Think about this now. They're murmuring against Moses. They're getting ready to stone Moses. And God says, Moses, when that water comes out, it's for all the people to drink. Ooh. Look, I, I, you got to forgive me, all right? But if somebody's about to kill me, they're going to be thirsty today. They're not getting any water from me. But God now, he says, Moses, let them all drink. So here's, here's what a person that's carnal will say. A person that's carnal will say, well, if everyone benefits from it, then why do I have to follow? Think about that now. If we all get to drink, then why do I have to follow Moses? But watch this now. There were some satisfied folks, but then there's a sad fact. The Bible says that God did this in the sight of the elders. They they were the only one to see where the water came from. See, we'll get some of us will get to see the results of what God did, but we'll never know how he did it. Look, you may say, well, praise the Lord. There's a visitor here this morning while another person will say I knocked on that person's door. You'll say, praise the Lord, we got a building program going, while another person will say, I gave to that building program. You'll get to enjoy it, but you'll never know how God did it. It's a sad fact. And the elders were the only ones that got to see, but everyone was blessed. Then we get to a heated confrontation. There was a hindrance in the congregation. There was a highlight in their calamity, but now there's a heated 
confrontation. You know why Christian people in the church cannot fight each other? Because the devil is still on attack. And if the, if the battle is inside the church, there is no victory. I'll say it again. If the battle is inside the church, there is no victory. We cannot waste time fighting each other because the devil is still on attack. And it is amazing now. Right when they're planning to kill Moses, the enemy comes. And you better believe that the devil knows when to show up. And just when there's a bunch of problems inside the church, the devil will show up and try to dwindle that church down to nothing so the gospel cannot be spread. And now they have a war. They have a war now. Right on their hands, right when they're planning to kill Moses. And Moses starts giving out some orders in verse number nine. It says, and Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Moses, he gave some orders. This order, it was very specific. Moses said, choose you out men. Listen now, choose you out men. Can you imagine now? The enemy is attacking, and here comes all the ladies with their pink swords. Moses, we're ready to fight. We're ready. Moses, come on. We're ready. No, no. Moses said, hey, choose out the men. And I just want to say something to the men here at Clearbrook Baptist Church. A church will never be what it should be or never be what it could be if men are not in their place. But I'm so glad. I love it that we had a prayer, men's prayer meeting every night this week. That, that's how it should be. Men should be out in front and men should be out leading because God uses men. Amen. If a church is going to be what it should be, men have to lead. That's right. He says, choose you out men. It was a very specific battle. But then it was kind of suspect because Moses then said, choose you out men. And then tomorrow I will go up to the hill with the rod of God. Moses, uh, excuse me, sir, but... Um, if I'm going to be down there fighting, I would really appreciate it if you went up to the mountain today. <laughs> I, I wouldn't really enjoy just out there fighting all day. But Moses said, tomorrow I'll go up into the mountain with the rod of God. So it, it was kind of suspect. But guess what? They still obeyed. Our lack of understanding of what God is doing does not neglect our responsibility to obey. Amen. You, you may not always get it. And you may not always understand it because here's the truth now. God can speak to leaders in a way that he won't speak to those that are following. And God may lay something on Pastor Brian's heart that he won't lay on my heart. God may lay something on my pastor's heart back home that he doesn't lay on my heart. But I still must support my pastor, though I don't understand. It was kind of suspect. But at the same time, it was sustaining. Well, what did he say? And take the rod of God. He said, I will take the rod of God. The same rod that you used that you cast? Yep, same rod. The same rod that you used at the Red Sea, same rod. Okay, Moses, I'll go then. You know why? Because the rod, it still works. It's so amazing. When Moses was struggling with his surrender, remember, he didn't really want to do it. God, 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 God. He said, God, 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 I don't, I don't, don't, don't speak well. God, 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 I, I stu stu stutter. No. Look, God says you can still do it. And in that chapter, in Exodus chapter number three, it was called the rod of Moses. But by the time we get to Exodus chapter number 17, it's called the rod of God. Look, God can use exactly what you have if you give it to him. Amen. It's no longer called the rod of Moses. It's called the rod of God. It was very sustaining. So he gave some orders to him. They were obedient. They, they went up to the mountain and obeyed what God told them to do. So first we had the hindrance in the congregation. Then we had a highlight in their calamity. God was still working even though they were plotting other things. There was a heated confrontation, but then we get to the point to where I believe every church should be, and that is when Moses started getting help from his comrades. Moses, he started getting some help from his comrades. And I, I just want to emphasize that again. He started getting help, all right? You know, what, you know what most church members would try to do? Moses, he's sitting there on the stone. He's holding up the rod of God. When the rod is up, they win. When the rod is dropped, they lose. You know what most church members do? Moses, give me that rod. I, you, I, knew, I knew you didn't know what you were doing. I didn't want to tell anybody, but I knew you didn't know. Give me the rod. Thank you. It's my turn now. Oh, no, 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 no. They did not take over. I should have got one amen there. They did not take over. They came in and assisted, and they helped the man of God. So look now, when you start getting help in the middle of this confrontation 
in the middle of this heated battle, there, 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 it's going to lead to winning when you start getting help. It, it'll start winning. You'll start winning the battle. And in order for that to take place, there must be some cooperation within the church. The Bible says that Aaron got on one side and her, he got on the other side. And the Bible says that they held up the hands of the man of God. There has to be some cooperation. Can you imagine if Aaron said, now look, her, I'm left handed. So it's easier for me to stand on the left side because it'll be a lot easier. No, no, no. I'm left handed, too. And they're arguing. While they're arguing, you're losing the battle. While they're arguing, you're losing the battle. There has to be there has to be some type of cooperation. But then there has to be some type of consistency. They did not just come and say, all right, Moses, you got it. I'll be back. I'm going to take a break. No, no, the Bible says that they were there until the going down of the sun. They were there until the going down of the sun. Look, it's not hard to find people to do something. That's not the hard part. The hard part is, is finding someone that can be faithful. It's not hard to find someone to do one job. It's hard to find somebody that can be consistent in the job that they have. And in order for them to win this battle, there had to be some cooperation and there had to be some consistency. That was the winning of the battle. Isn't it amazing? Look, I want you to see now how much their attitudes changed in this chapter. At the beginning of the chapter, they're about to stone Moses. At the end of the chapter, they're pulling over a stone for Moses to sit down on. You know, you know what's so amazing? You can take that same energy that you were using to hurt and use it to be a help and be a blessing. That, that same energy that you were using to fight against, you can use that same energy to fight for. First they wanted to stone him, but then they're pulling over a stone for the man of God to sit down upon. And it led to the winning of the battle. Then let's look at the writing in the books. The writing in the books. Look at verse number 14. It, this is so amazing. Look, this is not Moses speaking. This is not Aaron speaking. This is not her speaking. This is not one of the one of the warriors speaking. Look at this. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in the books and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from the heavens. God said this now. He said, why, why should we support the man of God? Because supporting by the man of God is praised by God. Look, God, it's all, can you imagine now? God is in heaven. He's seeing the children of Israel lose when Moses' hands drop. When Moses' hand is up, he's seeing them win. And then he looks down and he sees Aaron and her supporting their hands up so they can keep winning the battle. God is watching this. God is, God is looking at this. I want to ask you a question. When God looks down at Clearbrook Baptist Church, what does he see? And let me remind you now that God sees a place that only he can see. So you can you can do something, certain actions, but with the wrong motive. And God is looking at your motive. Look, it was, it was something that was praised by God. God says, look, write this down in the book. Why was it praised by God? Because it was also a, a preparation for the next generation. He said, write it in the book. Why am I writing it in the book? He said, so it can be rehearsed in the ears of Joshua. Look, Joshua, one day you will be leading. Look, one day you will be out in front. One day you will be the man of God. Look, the next generation needs to know how important it is to support the man of God. Amen, and you've been here for 32 years. Praise the Lord. But I wish you 32 more. Amen. And that even you may not even be here. This, you may be long gone, but Clearbrook Baptist Church can still stand even after Pastor Brian is not even here. But it has, we have to leave it now with the good testimony. Amen. Your children, they should see. That you're supporting the man of God. When, when you're in the car and, you know, we get to talking sometimes. Your children, they should see that you're supporting the man of God. When, when you're sitting around the dinner table and you get to talking about some things, your children now, they should see that you're supporting the man of God. Isn't it so good now that in this chapter, God says, write it down and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I want to ask you a question now. If God were rehearsing some things in your children's ear, what would they hear? When, when they heard this now, it was all about supporting the man of God, the writing in the books, the winning of the battle. Then we see the waving of the banner. Look at verse number 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of the altar Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. Look, here, here it is now. You're not supporting the man of God just to lift up Pastor Brian. That's not the goal. 
the goal in chapter number 17 was not just to hold up the hands of, man of, of, of the man of God just so Moses could be seen. No, 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 no. The whole purpose of everything we do in the Christian life is to lift up Jehovah. So you can lift up God by lifting up the man of God and by supporting the man of God. And God's work will go forward and God's work will go on. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about God. And by the way, he's worthy of that type of praise. He's the only one that deserves that type of praise. And I think it's best that he gets it from the local New Testament church. Last night we talked about in great details the crucifixion. And we talked about the cross. You, you say, well, how important is church? The church is, so, the church is as important as your salvation. You say, well, you say well, well, why do you say that? Because it was purchased with the same thing. The Bible says that the church was purchased with his own blood. It was purchased with his own blood. The Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Even so much the more as you see the day approaching. That verse is in the same chapter when it's talking about the flesh being the veil that was rent. So though you can meet with God at your house, that's great. But the best place to meet with God is in the house of God. Amen. The church, it is vitally important in the Christian life. You cannot be the Christian that God intended you to be without the local New Testament church. And the church cannot be the type of church God wants it to be without the man of God. It's about time we had some churches all over this country. Instead of running down the man of God, they lifted up the man of God. Not just so he can be lifted up, but so Jehovah can be lifted up because he's worthy of that type of praise. He's a great God. And God, after he did all these things for the children of Israel, they forgot about it. And look, I'm not saying churches don't have problems. Every church has its problems. You can't have this many people in one room and not have a problem. <laughs> Every church has its problems. But this is what spiritual people do. Spiritual people, they can take a big problem and make it seem small. But a carnal person, they'll take a small problem and make it seem so big. It would be such a blessing if this church were filled with spiritual people. Because it's not just about me. It's not just about how I feel about something, but if I can let go of some of my preferences and let go of some of my feelings so God can be lifted up, that's what I want to do. It was all about God. And they lifted up God by supporting the man of God. So I just, I just, want, I just want this question to be on your mind. Are you supporting God's man? Through your prayers, through your giving, through your faithfulness, are you supporting the man of God? Of God. God brought Moses there just for the children of Israel. And it would have been a shame if God brought them there and they did not support him. It would have been a shame. But thank God we have testimony that in this chapter, at least, they did support the man of God. And my prayer tonight is this, that Clearbrook Baptist Church would be a church that supported and lifted up the man of God. Again, not just to lift him up but so Jehovah can be lifted up. Amen. Lord, I thank you for being so good and kind to us. God, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. God, I thank you just for most of all being God. God, I thank you for giving us a place where we can meet and a place where we can worship God and a place where we can be underneath your word. God, I pray you help us to never make light of the New Testament church. Never make light of your man. God, may we submit ourselves to pastoral leadership. God, I pray you continue to be with Clearbrook Baptist Church. God, I I can sense that you have people here that have genuine hearts for God. So, Lord, I pray that you would use them not just to be a, a blessing here in the Roanoke area, but all across this world. So, God, I pray you continue to help us and bless Pastor Brian as he comes. In your name we do pray. Amen.